Jesus said, you've heard that it was said by those of old, you shall not murder, and whosoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you've paid the last penny. So that's our text today. It's Matthew chapter five. We're back in our series, God Came Near. It's uh, sort of a quadraphonic look at the life of Christ, a chronological look, trying from all four gospels, going from event to event, teaching to teaching. And when we last were in this series, we were looking at the Sermon on the Mount. So we pick up where we last left off. And my message title is what Jesus taught about anger hatred, and lust. Let's pray. Now, Father, as we open your word and we read this amazing sermon, really the greatest sermon ever preached, we pray that we will see how it works in our life. The things that we're about to consider are not easy. They're challenging. They're very hard. And in some ways, they seem impossible. But by the power of your spirit, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens, uh, strengthens us. So we ask your blessing now in this time of Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our country is facing a formidable enemy today. They're called ISIS, ISIL. But it's much broader, broader than that. It's Islamic terrorism. And they have a simple objective they want a global caliphate, a global Islamic society, and they want to destroy us in the United States of America. This has been demonstrated in tangible ways. The first, probably the most notable, there were others before this, but what really put this on the radar screens of most Americans, as well as people around the world, was the attack on 9-11 as we watched in shock as the twin towers of the World Trade Center just crumbled and all that life was lost. Then more recently, there was the Boston bombing and then we recently saw two American journalists beheaded on camera. This particular group, ISIS, is uh, very savvy with social media, getting their message out. In fact, they've sort of made jihad cool, in quotes. And a lot of young people, uh, some even from America, but more from England and other parts of the world, are joining up. So this is what's before us right now. So our president recently said that he was going to destroy ISIS. And we hear that and we think, well, okay, but how does that work? Uh, does not the Bible teach that we're to turn the other cheek and we're to go the other mile? Is there really a place for retaliation? Some would even question if there's a place for the military or the police force. Shouldn't a Christian effectively be a pacifist? After all, wasn't Jesus himself the ultimate pacifist? Well, we're going to find the answer to those questions and more. Because here in the greatest sermon ever preached is effectively the worldview of Jesus Christ. Do you want to know what Jesus Christ thinks? Study this sermon. Do you want to, excuse me, got a stinking cold. Uh, do you want to know how his heart really beats? Study this sermon. Do you want to know how he feels about life and living in general? Again, study their sermon. The Sermon on the Mount is the official manifesto of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But let me add a word of warning. This sermon is for believers only. Remember those jackets from years ago? Members only. How many of you have those jackets? Okay, how many of you are wearing one today? 
How many of you still consider it a fashionable item? They'll probably come back. Well, we didn't know when we were members of, but we had members only jackets, right? This is for believers only. And now here's how the greatest sermon ever preached begins. Verses one to two of Matthew five. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying. So I want you to notice that this was directed not to the multitudes or to culture or to society in general. It was directed to his disciples. The phrase, then he opened his mouth, is a colloquialism in Greek. It's used to describe something that is solemn and grave and dignified. It speaks of a weighty statement. When he opened his mouth, this was important what Jesus was saying. But the only people that can live by the Sermon on the Mount are followers of Jesus Christ. Even back then, as now, Jesus had his fair weather followers. You know, when he was performing miracles and providing free lunch, they were in. When he spoke of sacrifice and commitment, they were gone with the wind. So these words were delivered to committed believers. And what he says in this sermon here before us and in the whole sermon in general is amazing, it's mind-boggling, it's beautiful, and it's impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. No one can live by these standards without God's help. Now it's funny because some people will say, well, you know, all the, all the religion I need is found in the Sermon on the Mount. And I often will respond by saying, well, quote something from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Judge not lest you be judged. That's everyone's favorite verse. That's the non-believer's favorite verse. We'll deal with that later. Judge not lest you be judged. I like that. But, you know, listen, you cannot live by the Sermon on the Mount. It's harder to live by the Sermon on the Mount than it is to live by the Ten Commandments because this sermon deals so much with the heart. You know, you can to a certain degree have an external obedience, but when it comes to the heart, that's a very hard thing to control. So you can be doing the right thing outwardly, but inwardly still wanting to do the wrong thing. So this sermon deals with motives, why we do what we do. And you could sum it up this way, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So now here is Jesus speaking to his disciples. You remember that the Sermon on the Mount starts with the Beatitudes. Those are sort of the, the gate into the sermon. You have to follow these things if you're going to even come close to understanding what Jesus is teaching. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, and so forth. So this is addressed to people who are poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means you see that you're spiritually bankrupt before God. It means that you realize that you need God's help, and then you mourn over that condition. You're sorry for your sin, and the result is you have a new hunger for godly things. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So let me read it again uh, from the New Living Translation, what was already read in the video. Matthew 5, verse 38, Jesus speaking, you've heard that it was said of old, of those of old, you shall not murder. You've heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder, and if you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say to you, if you're angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. If you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the temple, there at the altar, and suddenly remember someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. While you're on your way to the court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly, otherwise your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you'll be thrown into prison. If that happens, you won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. You've heard the commandment that says, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
If your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Stop there. Told you it was hard. Because already you're asking questions, aren't you? Like, uh, seriously? How does that work? So Jesus deals with three areas of sin that are very widespread in our culture. I think these three areas of sin are probably in most movies that you see in the theaters. They're anger, hatred, and lust. But again, Jesus is dealing with the heart. Sin deceives me into thinking that if I've not done the actual deed, I'm all right. But why haven't you done the actual deed? Why haven't you murdered that person that you hate? Hopefully you don't, but let's assume you do. Why haven't you committed adultery? You see, if you still want to do it in your heart, the problem still exists. The root is still there. Anger is murder in the heart. Lust is adultery in the heart. That's what Jesus is pointing to, verse 22. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, you'll be in danger of the judgment. Now, let's make it clear that there is a place for anger. Uh, this is not saying that a Christian cannot be angry. There are certain things that should anger us. The Bible even says over in Ephesians, be angry and do not sin. So there's a place for righteous indignation. That's not what this is talking about. In fact, the word that is used here for anger is interesting. It means a settled anger, a malice that is nursed inwardly. This is not even describing a person who maybe gets irritated and flies off the handle and then apologizes. Hopefully you don't punch your wife out and leave her cold in an elevator. Um, this is a person who is bitter, developing a grudge, nursing and feeding it. This is a person that is throwing gasoline on the fire of anger. This is a person who is consumed with anger. Many people in the depths of their heart have anger and hatred to such a degree their true desire is for the hated person to be dead. Do you feel that way about anyone? Please don't raise your hand. If you do, let's be honest, if you do, here's what the Bible says. 1 John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. 1 John 2, 9, he that says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Scripture is saying you cannot be a follower of Jesus and live with this boiling, settled anger that you feed and fuel every single day. There's no place for it. The word hate means to habitually despise, not just a transient motion of the affections, a deep-rooted loathing. You know, when you see this certain person, you just loathe them. Oh, you, you just are so bitter toward them. Why do we get this way? Well, sometimes our anger is rooted in envy. Remember the story of Cain and Abel. Effectively, Cain killed his brother because he was envious of him. What is envy? It's been defined as a discontent or uneasiness at the sight of another's good fortune accompanied with some degree of hatred and desire to possess equal advantages. So it's not like a person has done something against you personally. It's simply a person who has really succeeded. Maybe it's monetary succession. Maybe they married someone you wished you could have married. Maybe they've accomplished something you wished you could have accomplished. They got that position you felt you should have. Whatever it is, you're envious and it grows and it turns into something even worse. Thomas Fuller said, quote, envy shoots at another and wounds itself. The only person who suffers when you envy is you. Now listen to this, verse 22. Jesus says, I say, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of judgment. But if you say to your brother, Raka, you'll be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool will be in danger of hellfire. Now we don't even know what that means. You probably can't even remember the last time you said to someone, Raka. They'd be like, what? <laughs> but back in this culture, that word carried a lot of weight. Raka was used in Jesus' day, but there's no modern equivalent. Maybe you could say brainless idiot, 
empty head, bonehead, something like that. It was a phrase of arrogant contempt where you felt superior to the person you were addressing. Then the word fool speaks of an obstinate, godless person. It was effectively condemning them. So it's not so much the word raka or fool as much as it is a revealing of the bitterness of a person's heart. Uh, the Bible says, Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of a heart, a mouth speaks. Now Jesus deals with lust in the heart, verse 27 to 30. You've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery, but I say whoever looks on a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. Now, this is not just talking about a casual glance. It's speaking of a continual act of looking. You know, sometimes it's sort of that second look, right? You know, so you see an attractive woman or an attractive guy, and you, you see them. They walk right into your eye view, you know. You go, oh, attractive woman or attractive guy. So it's not like, like oh, it's more like this. Oh, whoa. <laughs> and it's not just whoa, it's whoa. Because the idea that's being conveyed here is of intentional and repeated gazing with a purpose of lusting. So you're not admiring beauty, you're lusting after that person. By the way, we usually think this is a guy thing. Oh no, it can be a girl thing too. It's looking at any person with lust in your heart. This is talking about a person who goes out of their way to look at someone to lust after them. Needless to say, if you look at pornography, you would be violating this commandment. You're intentionally looking at things that will stimulate lust. You're looking at someone for the deliberate purpose of lusting. Probably the best example of this in the Bible is the story of David and Bathsheba. Of course, David was up on his rooftop because back in those days there Rooftop was sort of like a terrace. You see a lot of this in New York City. You know, they use every bit of space they can find. So there up on his terrace in his royal palace, uh, David was just hanging out and looking over his little balcony there. And there in eyes view was the beautiful Bathsheba, ironically, taking a bath. And David went, wow. And he saw her, and the Bible says she was beautiful. And when the Bible says a girl's beautiful, she's really beautiful. <laughs> you know, when the Bible says a man was, you know, well-built, or it describes a first person's physical attributes, what it is saying is they were really exceptional. So she was an incredibly beautiful and attractive woman. There was, okay, he saw her. She doesn't have any clothing on. So he saw it. He couldn't have stopped that first look. But that first look went on a long time. And he looked and he looked. And then, of course, he gave the commandment for her to be brought up to his palace. And he had sex with her and she became pregnant. We all know the story. But, you know, Bathsheba has a responsibility here, too. No modest Hebrew woman would ever bathe publicly. Did Bathsheba indeed know that she was within eyeshot of the palace? If I'm standing here, I know the king comes out on the balcony. Did she position herself? Well, I can't say that she did. I'll say this. David was the most culpable in this sin because he misused his authority, misused his position. But she was culpable. She could have said no as well. This is a two-way street. If lustful looking is bad, and it is, then those who dress and expose themselves with the desire to be looked at and lusted after are also guilty, right? So girls, I'm talking to you. Think about what you wear or what you don't wear when you walk out that door. You might say, well, what do you, how do I know? Well, think of it this way. What if Jesus was picking you up to take you to church or out to dinner? Would you wear that? <laughs> no, but well, think of it that way. So you want to be a good witness. Modesty is still a good thing. And you don't want to wear something that would stimulate lust. You say, Greg, please, you know, some guys would lust after a tree. <laughs> this is true. In fact, that guy is, no. Um, 
This is true. I can't deny that. But I think you girls know what's going on with this. And I think you understand how this works. And so we want to be very careful. David's sin was a continuous look, and then he took dramatic action. So here's where it starts with lust. You have to guard your mind. Job said in Job 31.1, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. How does this work in real life? Well, let's say you're in a movie, and there's a sex scene in the film you didn't know about. And it, <laughs> there it is. And you're going, oh, I didn't know this was going to be here. What do I do? You could walk out. Well, I paid for the film. So, what if something comes on your TV screen and it, it's suggestive and, and, you know, if the kids were there, you would turn it off, but since they aren't, well, it's part of the plot and need to look at this and understand this. You know, you can hit the off button. What if you're walking down the street and an attractive girl or guy is coming your way and, you know, some people, the way they put themselves together, the way they walk, it's all about look at me right now, Right? And you see that person, oh, there's one of those people. You know what? You just look at the ground. Just walk, just, you know, don't look at the ground forever. You might bump into them or a tree that you'd lusted after earlier. <laughs> but you know, you see them in the coming, you just go, hmm, just look down, look up after they're gone. Some people want to be looked at, you know. That's what they're all about. But don't let your mind go to that place. And if a conversation happens with members of the opposite sex and maybe it becomes a little suggestive, terminate it. Did you know most affairs happen in the workplace? You know, when people work closely together, they become friendly with one another and then one thing leads to another. So you have to be very careful in this area. Check out something before you watch it or read it. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. So Jesus gives a solution now. Are you ready? Here's how to fix it. Verse 29. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. Okay. Is that literal? Uh, no. So what does it mean? Jesus is talking about how to be delivered from this sin. Clearly, he's not speaking literally. You could pluck out your right eye and still lust with your left eye. For that matter, you could pluck out both eyes and still manage to lust. You could cut off your right arm and still sin with your left arm. You could have no arms and still lust. Here's really the point Jesus is making. Give up whatever is necessary to keep from falling into this sin. Does that make sense? Give up whatever is necessary to keep from falling into this sin. See, I have a real problem with, with, you know, internet pornography. I just can't overcome it. Okay, you know what? Unplug. Dump the computer if you have to. You know, some people maybe can't handle it. It might be another area. I know you all probably have heard the story of a man named Aaron Ralston. He was the man that cut off his arm to save his life. Remember him? A movie was made about his life. He's right rock climbing, and his right hand was on the side of a boulder, and it shifted, pinning his hand. Well, Ralston knew how to use his equipment, so he used his ropes and his anchors and everything he had to remove the boulder, but it wasn't working. Now a couple of days pass. It's cold. He runs out of water. So he does something that's unthinkable. He pulls out his pocket knife and cuts off his arm. And he rappels 75 feet to the canyon floor and walks out. This whole ordeal lasted five days. Now that's radical, but really it's incredibly smart. Because you can have both arms and die or lose an arm and live. And that's the way he saw it. So in the same way, cut off whatever it takes in your life to live spiritually. Anything that morally or spiritually traps us or causes us to fall in sin or stay in sin must be eliminated quickly and completely. Hebrews 12 says, lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets you and run with endurance the race that is set before us. And by the way, this can vary from person to person. Some people are more vulnerable 
in an area than others are. So you have to look at your own life. So that's the solution. Take action. Now Matthew 5.38. You've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say don't resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands you carry his gear for a mile, go two miles. Give to those that ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You've heard that it was said, love your enemy, or excuse me, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, praise for the, pray for those who persecute you, and that way you'll be acting as true children of your father. Now this is hard stuff, is it not? Needless to say, these are very high standards. Turning the other cheek. Going the extra mile. Loving our enemies. Are these the standards that we should govern society by? And if they are, how can we justify military or police force? Well, the 19th century Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy wrote a book entitled, What I Believe in which he gave, came to the conclusion after he read the Sermon on the Mount and reread it, he said, quote, Christ forbids the human institution of any court because they resist evil and even return evil for evil. He believed criminals love good and hate evil as I do. He didn't think a Christian should be involved in the military, police force, or courts of law. One man who was profoundly impacted by the writings of Tolstoy was Mahatma Gandhi. And he believed by practicing this teaching you could bring about a perfect state where punishment would end and prisons would be turned into schools. Newsflash, Tolstoy and Gandhi were wrong because they were misunderstanding what these teachings are saying. This Sermon on the Mount was not given to govern a society. You govern a society by what is said in verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This comes from Exodus 21 and continues. Hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. This is the same as the expression tit for tat. This was the Hebrew civic justice system. What was its purpose? According to Deuteronomy 19.20, the rest will hear and be afraid and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Listen, criminals don't love good and hate evil. In fact, most people don't love good and hate evil. Most people, let me restate that, all people have sinful hearts and were drawn in the wrong direction. Now, if a heart changes, that's fantastic. Like Michael Franzese was a, made member of the mafia, but he was converted in prison. Now he no longer longs for those things. That's fantastic. But when someone breaks those laws, there has to be a punishment. Now that punishment is never to be carried about by the victim, but by the legal system. We as a nation need law enforcement and military. Government as an entity has been established by God. Romans 13 says, obey the government for God put them there. All governments have been placed in power by God. So to those who refuse to obey the laws of the land, they're refusing to obey God and punishment will follow. For the authorities do not frighten people that are doing right. They frighten those who do wrong. Do what they say and you'll get along well. <laughs> I have a friend who's a chief of police and sometimes we meet for coffee and he'll bring along another of the officers and these guys, you know, they're dressed in their police uniforms. They got the Sam Brown on, which is that heavy utility belt with all the equipment. You know, you've got a place for the walkie-talkie, a place for the gun, a place for handcuffs, a place for a donut. And um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but he's got stars. He's got stars in his uniform because he's the chief. And it's funny how people react. You know, when he orders coffee, oh, he, <laughs> you know, Everyone gets a little nervous. You know why? He's an authoritative figure. When he puts that uniform on, it changes the dynamic of a room. Uh, and guess what? He's been placed there by God. Well, what if he's not a Christian? He's still placed there by God. So there's a respect. And if you're obeying the law, you don't fear the police. 
If you are not obeying the law, this becomes a great problem. Speaking of the military police and those that enforce law, Scripture says they are God's servant to do good, and if you do wrong, be afraid, for they don't bear the sword for nothing. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, well, what about if the, the nation is corrupt? What about if the police officer is corrupt? And that does happen, doesn't it? Well, look, we have a higher principle we obey. Uh, the apostles were told to no longer preach the gospel by the authorities. What did they do? They went out and preached the gospel. And they said this, we must obey God and not man. So if our government were to pass a law that said to you, you can no longer practice your faith, you no longer can pray, you no longer can preach, do we obey that law because the Bible says obey your civil government? Do we? No, we don't. Because we have a higher law. When a law was passed that no one could pray. That's right. When a law was passed that no one could pray, uh, Daniel prayed openly. He said, well, there's just laws they don't think are godly or my taxes are too high. Well, then vote for somebody that will lower your taxes next time. That's why we have our system to elect people that represent us properly, but we have to obey the law. You may not always agree with it. And keep in mind when Paul wrote these words, who were the authorities? The Roman government and Caesar. Hardly what I would call a, a model of virtue. So still Paul says the authorities have their place. He talks about a sword, verse four. He does not bear the sword for nothing. He's God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. A sword is an instrument of death. It's not to wrap a person on the knuckles, but to run him through. If a Roman soldier drew a sword, you have trouble. If a police officer draws his gun, he's ready for a confrontation. So you understand that that's what that is all about. So God has placed these people in their position. In fact, it's interesting that Paul actually used a soldier as a model of what it is to be a Christian. Paul spent a lot of time with soldiers. Why? Because he got arrested all the time. And on some occasions he was chained to them. So they'd become friends probably. And he knew all about their armor. In Ephesians 6, he talks about the shield of faith and the breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation. He knew how all that Roman armor worked and what its purpose was. He used the idea of the military and how we should follow Jesus. He said in 2 Timothy 3, 4, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And as Christ's soldier, do not let yourself be tied up with the affairs of this life. Then you can't satisfy the one who has enlisted you into his army. Now, God would never choose a dishonorable profession as an illustration for a Christian. <laughs> He wouldn't say, be clever like a thief, you know, or be passionate like a murderer. No, that's the wrong picture. But he did take the position of the soldier uh, as a very positive illustration. Now, some people like to think that Jesus was the ultimate pacifist. They like to think of Jesus as the first hippie, right? Just throwing flowers, peace and love, man probably with a lamb wrapped around his neck. I love those paintings of Jesus, lamb wrapped around his neck. Well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. That may be the Jesus of your imagination. But the Jesus of the Bible was loving and he was forgiving and he was compassionate and the children even came to him. But the Jesus of the Bible also administered justice. What do you think he was doing when he made a whip and drove the money changers out of the temple. And by the way, he told his disciples, as days were getting more dangerous, they may need their swords. Luke twenty two thirty six. Peter responded, well, we already have two swords. Now, why would they need to carry swords? To have shish kebab? It's called self-defense. They were entitled to defend themselves. A Christian can defend themselves. It's acceptable for a nation to defend themselves from those who want to harm them. Now, that's not to say we're to be some kind of a doormat. So you're saying, okay, well, what does this mean then? It's like you've almost said it doesn't apply. No, I'm just explaining what it doesn't mean, all right? 
There is a place for self-defense. You have your rights as an American citizen. Uh, God has the military, the police force. Okay, but now with that in mind, what does this mean? Turning the other cheek, going the extra mile. Jesus is giving specific advice for a believer when they're persecuted. These are not mechanical rules, but principles for meeting the personal wrongs that come to those who follow him. There are times where for the sake of the kingdom and the soul of a person, we take the hit or turn the other cheek or go the extra mile. What does that even mean? Well, back in these days, uh, when a Roman soldier would be out marching and he had his backpack, uh, a person, a citizen, was required to carry the backpack for him. So he'd be carrying all his gear, he has his army, he'd say, you, carry my backpack. You were obligated by law to carry it for a mile. So you carried it for a mile. Jesus says, here's what I say, don't carry it for a mile. Go the extra mile. So be like, hey, I've got it. Okay, okay, you're done. You can give it back to him. No, I'll keep carrying it. I'll go an extra mile with you because that'll give me a little more time to tell you about Jesus, see? So I, I'm gonna, that's where the phrase, go the extra mile, comes from. But then uh, he talks about churning the other cheek. What does that mean? Well, in verse 39, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other. Back in this culture, a slap in the face, striking someone in the face was among the most demeaning and contemptuous acts. Even a slave would rather be struck in the back than the face. It was a calculated insult. What would our modern equivalent be? Well, I think a slap would qualify. Someone slapped you in the face, we'd go, hey. right? What'd you do that for? Hey. You wanna hit back. But here's maybe one that we would understand. Someone spits in your face. Now that doesn't physically harm you, but it's humiliating, it's degrading. They spit in your face or they do an obscene gesture. They call it flipping the bird. Has anyone ever done that to you? I've had it done to me. Not while I'm preaching, however. <laughs> that would be just alarming. But on the road, man, people, they're crazy. You know, they'll cut in front of you, hit their brakes and do all this obnoxious stuff and you drive by and just look at them and then they'll flip you off. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, don't do it, don't do it. Just cruise by, forget it, let it go. Let it go, let it go. I know that song because I have four granddaughters and they sing it constantly, but it's really cute. This is speaking of a person that has an attitude that would not want to immediately strike back. Now, is this an easy thing to do? Well, no. <laughs> I don't wanna say more so for a guy, but maybe more so for a guy. You know, guys, they'll just, hey, you took a guy off, boom, he's gonna hit back. Sometimes girls too, but uh, more often guys probably. But even the great apostle Paul struggled with this. He was struck by Ananias, the high priest, S hit. And Paul shoots back, God, I'll smite you, you whitewashed wall. Someone said, that's a high priest. Paul says, oh, I didn't know it was a high priest. He knew it was a high priest. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He knew what a high priest looked like. He's just irritated. He was human, like you, like me. So the point is, it's not easy. But this is the idea of just forgiving, going the extra mile, and listen, we've all been wronged in life. Most of us have been slandered, mistreated, ripped off, taken advantage of. But Jesus is not saying I should be the doorknob or doorknob, uh, the doormat. I don't even know what it would be to be a doorknob. <laughs> He's not saying that I should be the doormat for the planet. See, the problem is I have a cold and I'm on cold medication, a deadly combination. So who knows what else I'm gonna to say today. Already I've probably said a few things you're thinking, that's a little odd. This is Greg on cold medication. But here's what Jesus concludes with, verse 44. Love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We're not to strike out, but instead love them in a positive way. Abraham Lincoln said, quote, the best way to destroy an enemy is to make him a friend. 
That's good, isn't it? The best way to destroy an enemy is to make him a friend. This selflessness, this love Jesus calls for is found in many people that God used. It was the spirit of Abraham when he gave the best land to his undeserving nephew, Lot. It's the spirit of Joseph when he kissed his brothers who had so mistreated him. It's a spirit that would not let David take advantage of the opportunity to take the life of King Saul who had been pursuing him. It's a spirit that caused Stephen to pray for those that were stoning him to death. And it's a spirit that every one of God's children should have. May God help us to turn the other cheek and go the extra mile. May he enable us to have a change of heart for we do not harbor hatred and lust. You know, maybe as you've heard these words, some of these things have hit home. I hope all of them haven't hit home, but they may have. But maybe one of them, oh yeah, I've got that anger problem. Oh yes, the issue of lust, this is really a problem. Well, we need to pray and ask God to help us with these very areas of weakness. Because if you're harboring hatred for someone in your life, I want to tell you something. It's going to bring your prayer life to a halt. Look at verse 23. If you're presenting the sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go be reconciled to that person. Then come and bring your sacrifice to God. So maybe you're praying. You feel like your prayers are going nowhere. But as you're praying, sitting three pews behind you as a person you hate. Every time you see them, your heart fills with hatred. Maybe it's motivated from envy, maybe something else, they mistreated you, they said something of that kind. You hate them and you seethe with anger whenever you see them. I hate, hate, oh Lord, I love you so hate you. Love you, love you, Lord, hate, love, hate. Maybe I should take cold medication more often. I don't know. <laughs> kind of loosened up. <laughs> that's going to kill your prayer life because that's unconfessed sin. And the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The story is told of Corey Ten Boom. Have you ever heard of Corey Ten Boom? How many of you know of her? Well, if you've never read her book, she wrote a book called The Hiding Place, which is her uh, autobiography of all that she suffered in World War II. Just quick fly over. The Ten Boom family lived in Holland. They were Dutch, obviously, and they were strong Christians. And as the Jews were being persecuted by the Germans, they took Jewish people into their home and they built these false walls to hide rooms that they kept the Jewish people in because they felt that God wanted them to love and show uh, favor to God's chosen people. Well, the Gestapo found out about it. They warned them to stop and the Ten Boom family would not. And one day the Gestapo showed up and they arrested Corey, her sister Betsy, and her father and took them off to concentration camps. The father quickly died. He was rather elderly. And Corey and Betsy ended up in a camp called Ravensbrück. And uh, sadly, Betsy died in that camp. And uh, Corey was released because of a clerical error. She should have stayed in, but she got out and she recognized it was the providence of God. And she spent the rest of her life as a self-described tramp for the Lord, sharing her story with people. I had the privilege of hearing her in person. She was an amazing woman. Well, she shares this story in her book, The Hiding Place. She was out at church in Munich, Germany. Uh, and here's what she says. I was in this church when I saw him, the former SS men who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was one of the first of the actual jailers that I had seen since that time, and suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing, and he said, how grateful I am for your message, Fraulein. He said, thank God that he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. Corey says, I who had preached so often to people that they need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus had died for this man. And I'm gonna ask for more. 
Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And again, I prayed a silent prayer, writes Corey. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And as I shook his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. And while my heart sprang, out of my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. As I discovered it's not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on God's. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command, the love itself. Isn't that great? So she just did it. So here's this person. They drive you crazy. You're mad. They said this. They, they did that. Okay, why don't you just go and forgive them? <laughs> no way. Don't just go for it. I don't feel it. Do it anyway. Well, I wouldn't be sincere because it doesn't matter. Just do it. So like Corey, you come and say, you know, I just forgive you. And you'll find that it will help you maybe even more than it will help them. When you forgive a prisoner, excuse me, when you forgive someone, you set a prisoner free yourself. You're set free. See, they may not even be aware of how much you hate them. They don't even know about your bitterness. They could care less about you, but it consumes you and it's hurting you and it's killing you slowly. So why don't you do what Jesus said? But they're my enemy. Really? Love your enemies, Jesus said. So you can love them. How do you do it? You just do it. You don't wait till you feel it. You just do it. There's no greater example of someone who did all these things than Jesus himself. Remember, after the Lord identified Judas as his betrayer, and then our Lord said, whatever you do, do it quickly, and Judas left. Jesus encountered Judas again in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Judas approaches, followed by the temple guard and other soldiers, Jesus says to him, friend, why have you come? I find that amazing. Friend, he knew he was there to betray him. He knew he was facilitating the arrest of Christ, and yet Jesus says, friend, why have you come? It was one last chance for Judas to repent, and he missed it, but Jesus offered it. Then, of course, as Jesus hangs on the cross, what are his first words? It's a prayer, and he says to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You say, well, that's good for Jesus. He's God. True. <laughs> but the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're to follow his example. Jesus died on that cross because we need forgiveness and then we should extend that forgiveness to others. Listen, forgiven people should be forgiving people. And Jesus will forgive you. Maybe some of you come in here with just a load of sin on your back. You know, you are the person consumed by lust. Or maybe you've committed adultery multiple times that you haven't been found out yet. You're that person consumed by envy and bitterness and even hatred. You need to be forgiven by God. We're gonna close in prayer and give you an opportunity to ask for his forgiveness. Let's all pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus, not just as an example, but also as a savior for sinners. And we are those sinners. Thank you for his death on the cross in his resurrection. And thank you for his promise of forgiveness. When our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm gonna extend an invitation to really anyone that needs forgiveness. Maybe you're not a Christian yet. You're not sure that you'll go to heaven when you die. But you've committed some of the sins we've talked about today or even more, and you would like to be forgiven. If you want Christ to forgive you of your sin, if you wanna know you'll go to heaven when you die, would you just raise your hand up wherever you are and I'll pray for you. Raise your hand up saying, I want Christ in my life. I want his forgiveness. God bless you. Lift your hand up high where I can see it, please. God bless you up there in the balcony. God bless you. Anybody there at Harvest Orange County, you raise your hand too. At the satellite uh, services, you raise your hand. Wherever you are, God sees you. This is between you and him. While our heads are still bowed, now let me address Christians. Maybe you've been struggling with lust. Maybe you've been struggling with hatred and bitterness 
even against a fellow believer. Maybe they're not a believer, but whoever that person is, you need to repent. And you want to take this little step today and say, Lord, I got the message loud and clear, and I'm ready to repent. If that's you, raise your hand up. I'm not going to have you come forward or stand or anything, but just as an act of faith and obedience, raise your hand up. Saying, that's me, and I want it gone. God bless you. Anybody else? No pressure. Do it if you want to. Don't do it if you don't want to. God bless you. Lord, you see these hands and you know the backstory. Now I pray that you will help each one to forgive. Even if they don't feel it, to forgive. If it's an issue of lust, Lord, to take appropriate steps to deal with it. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness for us, even your children, that we continue to need each and every day. Cleanse us by your blood. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. God bless you guys. Fantastic.